Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Krishna, Krishna. Hare Ram, Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna Krishna, Nithai Gaur. Hey, Hare Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 3, Pure Devotional Service, Verse Number 14. So, mm -hmm. Etat chusru satam vidvan Sutta nor hasi basitum Katahari kato darka Satam shu sadisi druvam H times two through Satam Vidvan Sutta Norhasi Basitum Katahari Kato Darka Satam Shu Sadisi Sadisi Durvam H times two through Satam Vidvan Sutta nor hasi basitum Katahari kato darka Satam shu sadisi druham
a tut this this a tut this oh translation okay susrusatam <laughs> for those eager to hear vidvan O oh, learned, Sutta, Sutta Goswami, Na, unto us, Arhasi, may you do it, Basitum, just to explain it, Kata, topics, Hari Kata Udar Ka, result in the topics of the Lord. Satam of the devotees, Shu may be Sadasi in the assembly of Juvam, certainly. <coughs> so, uh, Sonika Reach continues to address Sutta Goswami. O oh, learned Sutta Goswami, please continue to explain such topics to us because we are all eager to hear. Besides that, topics which result in the discussion of the Lord Hari should certainly be discussed in the assembly of devotees. Hmm. Srila Prabhupada's quite lengthy purport, and so please listen up. <laughs> As we have already quoted above from the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu of Rupa Goswami, even mundane things, if dovetail in the service of Lord Sri Krishna, are accepted as transcendental. For example, the epics of the histories of Ramayana and Mahabharata, which are specifically recommended for less intelligent classes, women, sudras, unworthy sons of the higher caste, are also accepted as Vedic literature because they are compiled in connection with the activities of the Lord. Mahabhar is accepted as the fifth division of the Vedas after its first four divisions, namely Sham, Sama, Yajur, Rik, and Atharva. <coughs> the less intelligent do not accept Mahabhar as part of the Vedas. The great sages and authorities accept it as the fifth division of the Vedas. Bhagavad Gita is also part of the Mahabharata and it is full of the Lord's instructions for the intelligent class, of, less intelligent class of men. Some less intelligent men say that the Bhagavad Gita is not meant for householders, but such foolish men forget that the Bhagavad Gita was explained to Arjuna, a Grihasta, a family man, and spoken by the Lord in his role as a Grihasta. So Bhagavad Gita, though containing the high philosophy of Vedic wisdom, is for the, the beginners in the transcendental science and Srimad Bhagavatam is for graduates and postgraduates in the transcendental science. Therefore, literatures like Mahabharata, the Puranas, and similar other literatures which are full of the pastimes of the Lord are all transcendental literatures and they should be discussed with full confidence in the society of great devotees. <coughs> The difficulty is that, that such literatures, when discussed by professional men, appear to be mundane literature like histories or epics because there are so many factual historical facts and figures. It is said here, therefore, that such literature should be discussed in the assembly of devotees. Unless they are discussed by devotees, such literatures cannot be relished by the higher class of men. So the conclusion is that the Lord is not impersonal in the ultimate issue. He is the supreme person, and he has his different activities. He is the leader of all living entities, and he descends at his will and by his personal energy to reclaim the fallen souls. Thus he plays exactly like the social, political, or religious leaders. Because such roles ultimately culminate in the discussing of the topics of the Lord, all such preliminary topics are also transcendental. That is the way of spiritualizing the civic activities of human society. Men have inclinations for studying history and many other mundane literatures, stories, fictions, dramas, magazines, newspapers, etc. 
So let them be dovetailed within the transcendental service of the Lord, and all of them will turn to the topics relished by all devotees. The propaganda that the Lord is impersonal, that he has no activity, and that he is a dumb stone without any name or form, has encouraged people to become godless, faithless demons. And the more they de deviate from the transcendental activities of the Lord, the more they become accustomed to mundane activities that only clear their path to hell instead of to return home back to Godhead. So here's a footnote at this point. So I'll read the footnote. Even 50 years ago, the social structure of all Indians was so arranged that they would not read any literature that was not connected with the activities of the Lord. They would not play any drama connected with the Lord not connected with the Lord. They would not organize a fair or ceremony not connected with the Lord, nor would they visit a place that has not holy and sanctified by the pastimes of the Lord. Therefore, even the common man in the village would talk about Ramayana and Mahabharata, Gita and Bhagavatam, even from their very childhood. But by the influence of the age of Kali, they have been dragged to the civilization of dogs and hogs, laboring for bread without any sense of transcendental knowledge. Srimad Bhagavatam begins from the history of the Pandavas with necessary politics and social activities. And yet Srimad Bhagavatam is said to be Paramahansa Samhita, or the Vedic literature meant for the most topmost transcendentalists, and is described Param Jnanam, the highest transcendental knowledge. Pure devotees of the Lord are always Paramahansas, for they are like the swans who know the art of sucking milk out of the mixture of milk and water. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Omagyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venumaha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Pandeham Shigaro Shiuta Badakamalam Shigarun Vaishnavam Scha Shi Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganat Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Scha E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Deen Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchina Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Suri Vrishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Taruvischa Kripa Sindhu Vevacha Pratitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhunathananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Hodavakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Na Prabhupada Ki Jai So with the advent of this particular age 5,100 years ago, we entered into what is known as Kali Yuga, out of the four ages of men, Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dapara Yuga, and Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga is the most difficult age for what we say living. Um, it's difficult in the sense that People are not inclined to religious activity. People are inclined to sense gratification and economic development. Each of the ages has certain characteristics that are somewhat prominent. In the uh, Satya Yuga, people were inclined to meditation. The atmosphere in Satya Yuga was very nicely arranged. It would only rain in the evenings and not during the day. And that way in the mornings when the sun would come out, the ground would be nice and moist from the rain and so many crops would grow by the presence of the sun. Everything that was organized so nicely 
they were uh, there was no sinful activity there may have been a few people who were who were less than spiritual maybe somewhat pious but there were no sinful activities in those ages and people lived out to up to 100,000 years you might think how is it possible well when the atmosphere is r nice and people are living according to the laws of nature, the laws of God. Everything is provided nice, and the body can last 100,000, maybe even more. But now, because everything has changed, the atmosphere has changed, people's attitudes have changed, everything goes down. So as we go through the different ages, the different characteristics of sinful activity become more prominent. And uh, illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, and gambling um, become more and more prominent as we go closer and closer to the present age of Kali. And therefore, uh, the principles of religion, which correspond to the four regulative principles of sinful activities um, mercifulness, austerity, truthfulness, and cleanliness. These are the four principles by which religion stands strong, are practically destroyed. There's no cleanliness left, hardly. It's destroyed by illicit sex. There's no uh, austerity left. People are always getting intoxicated in one form or another, either through some f type of substance or through some, some, some false forms of entertainment. And of course, meat eating, mercifulness is being destroyed by meat eating. Kid cows are being killed. And not only that, even now that they have a, it's become so degraded that even people are eating human beings. Humans are eating humans now. You can go in some restaurants in certain places around the world and they sell, they serve human fetuses, aborted fetuses, as a delicacy especially in France. So we have, uh, we have a pretty much, uh, since the advent of this age, the four sinful activities have become the means by which people live by. Illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, and various types of gambling. And so this age is very degraded. So the Vedic culture, which was prominent many, many millions of years ago, is gradually being eroded through what is called sinful activities and uh, a desire for sense gratification. It's a very difficult age. Manda su manda matayo manya bhaga upadritaha palyeno apayesa sabda kalogusk min jineja mandaha manda su manda matayo manya bhaga upadritaha. People are not inclined. They're lazy, unluck, unlucky, misguided, uh, and always disturbed. These are the characteristics of the persons in the age of Kali. It's a very difficult age. So the preach Krishna consciousness in this age is like going against, it's like trying, trying to ride a surfing wave when the waves are big waves, trying to go against the waves with your surfboard. <laughs> People try that. Usually they fall flat. <laughs> so it's it's very difficult to preach in this age because people are not inclined to spirituality. So that's why we mix up our preaching a little bit with some kind of niceties so people will become attracted to it. Mm, just like we say you like to sing, you like to dance, you like to eat. So that's what we do. Here's the music, here's the dance floor. We have nice foods, not only nice, but so many varieties of nice foods. So uh, come and sing and dance and eat with us. <laughs> and that way, they get tricked into performing some spiritual activities and make some progress in towards the goal of life. So it's a very difficult age. Here, Prabhupada talks about India specifically and how People would, a common man would listen to Srimad Bhagavatam and Ramayan. In fact, the culture in most villages around India hundreds of years ago, and it's still prominent in some areas of India 
even today, that they would, uh, they would gather, the whole village would gather, and some of the leading men in the village would read Srimad Bhagavatam, Ramayan, Mahabharata. And then people would hear these pastimes of the Lord just before the end of the day, and then it says they would go and then take their rest for the evening and many times dream about the Lord, having hear, heard the glories of the Lord as the last thing of the day. I was just hearing some one statistic where about 150 years ago, maybe even more, a little bit more maybe, 350 years ago, there were, th there were 750,000 um, Gurukuls, schools throughout India, and mostly all of them villages. And the main subjects they taught were Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharat, and Ramayana. That were the main subjects that they were, the children were exposed to. <coughs> and so we see now they're introducing this Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, and all kinds of frivolous types of activities for children to get what we can become more and more dull. The kids nowadays growing up, they're very dull. They're big. Kids are bigger now nowadays. Why? Because they, their bodies you know, are being fed all kinds of food to make you fat. <laughs> they get fat. You can see people are getting a little bigger. But it's more like a, a not really a healthy type of growth. It's more like just excess amount of, you know, flesh on the body. And people are lazy. They they work only if they can get something from it. They're enthusiastic to make arrangements for sense gratification. When it comes to religious activities, if we hold a festival. You know, during normal times, you know, how many people actually come? Just like one of my god brothers was preaching in Bombay. And uh, so he had a Pandal program. And there was actually others there also, other sadhus. And so, you know, many people came. But 99% of the people were women. Literally. About 1% was men. So the question is where all the men are. Well, it's the big cricket match tonight. So they're watching the cricket match. <laughs> Instead of coming to, you know, to hear transcendental topics. <laughs> so this is, the, this is how Kali Yuga is starting to evolve more and more. And all this, the demons also have plans to distract people's mind more and more through frivolous types of activities like that. And so the activities of the human beings have become more and more godless. And those who have some spiritual inclination, Prabhupada also says, preach that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is impersonal. He's just a manifestation of an energy that is a powerful energy that supports everything and is the basis of everything. But how do you develop an en a relationship with an energy? You don't. You have to re develop a relationship with a person. We are persons, and God is also a person. Therefore, there's a relationship. But when they relegate God to a just to a, a, a massive energy, where do you develop a relationship with that energy? <laughs> there's no love in an energy. There's no characteristics, personality, traits, and an energy. It's just energy. <laughs> so therefore, people who have some inclination towards spiritual life are being misled by others who pres present themselves as being, you know, spirituals because their idea that God is impersonal. Therefore, it is said that the that the uh, Maya bodies and the impersonalists are more like atheists. They're atheists. They don't believe in the personality of Godhead. And they believe that there's some power up there. 
but because they are envious of God, relegating God to this, this uh, energy, the whole idea is that, well, you know, if you disconnect with that energy, then that energy becomes part of you, then you become the energy, and you also become as powerful as the original energy, and then you become the supreme also. Because you're part of the supreme energy, you also become the supreme. And so this is the preaching that's going on. So it's very difficult to preach Krishna consciousness in this age. Very difficult. Because people have been misled by all kinds of wrong ideas and, and, and allurements for sense gratification. Therefore, it says here that when we discuss transcendental literature, it can only be done in the assembly of devotees. Because devotees have an understanding of what the nature of God and want to hear about the glories of God. And they accept the glories of God as being the qualities of the, of the Lord. Whereas people who come to religious assemblies or hold their own types of religious assemblies, such as scholars and academicians, they look at the whole thing from a historical, historical point of view and they make their own false conclusions based on on what they think is the scriptures. Like that. You know, the scholars study the scriptures. There's, there's, you know, you go to universities. They'll study Srimad Bhagavatam. They even study Chaitanya Charitamrita and other Vedic literatures. But their conclusion is always about history and principles, nothing about glorification of the Lord. So we have a, a great mission to somehow or other uh, see how to reverse this trend of impersonalism, atheism, that is everywhere. Therefore, we establish deity worship around the world. And because when people come and see the deity, and we say this is actually an incarnation of the Supreme Lord in his actual transcendental form, He's appeared within stone or wood or various types of metals simply for the sake of worship and, in, and simply for the sake of keeping our mind focused on his transcendental form and serving that form. So then honest people will accept and make progress like that and learn that yeah, Krishna is a person. Not only is he a person, but he's the best of all persons. He's the source of everyone else's personality, too, being the source of everything like that. So nowadays, um, when you arrange religious or, uh, programs, a few people come. But it says here that years ago, that's the only arrangement that was made. Nothing else was arranged. People would not have any kind of gathering unless it was centered around the Lord. The Lord was the main force, principle of all activities and the center for everyone's association. Of course, in certain areas of India, even today, when they hold uh, these big Pondo programs, thousands of people do come. But usually they get speakers who don't have understanding of what is the nature of God. And they speak all kinds of nonsense. And there's many stories where, I was just reading re recently, where Prabhupada was at this one Pondal program. And uh, there were these sp spiritualists. <laughs> this was in, uh, I think it was in uh, Hong Kong. And it was a big religious program there. And some of the local sadhus came. One local sadhu was very popular among the Indian congregation in Hong Kong. So Prabhupada came and they had arranged this thing. And then this one person, I think his name was Krishna Das, he was popular amongst the local sadhus. So he also came. So he spoke before Prabhupada. And it was in Hindi. So, when the devotees are there, they don't know what's going on. But Prabhupada is sitting there, and he's getting very much upset. Finally, Prabhupada yells out, Stop! <laughs> very loudly. 
stop. Sit down. Sh stop speaking. <laughs> I was really upset. <laughs> and everyone was shocked. What's happening? <laughs> and then, of course, the man who was speaking immediately stopped. Prabhupada said, have kirtan. And he began, devotees began kirtan. Prabhupada couldn't tolerate. This is the quality of a great soul. Because they have love for the Supreme Lord, when you hear about the person you love being talked about in a way that they have no personality, it really goes to the heart and makes you quite upset when you hear that person who you love is being talked about as somebody who really doesn't exist no more than an energy. The problem was like, fire, you know. And then one, another time when Prabhupada was in Kurukshetra, they had this big Pandal program. And so they had all these sadhus speaking, and they were all speaking about Krishna and Kurukshetra. So Prabhupada was the last speaker. So Prabhupada patiently sat through all these yogis and sadhus speaking. And then Prabhupada got up and just smashed everything they said. <laughs> he just took issue with everything they said and presented the clear conclusion that Krishna is the actual speaker of the Bhagavad Gita and Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When the devotees were riding back with Prabhupada in the car, Prabhupada was laughing. He said, I smashed him. <laughs> Prabhupada didn't care about popularity. Like, you know, sometimes we have to... People like to think, well, we have to speak nice because otherwise we won't be popular or we might make people think, you know, we're just being arrogant. But Prabhupada spoke the truth. He didn't compromise the truth in order to somehow patronize people's ideas. He spoke what is, the, this is the truth. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You are his eternal servant. Devotional service is the way you connect with Krishna. This was Prabhupada. Straight. Of course, we may not be able to speak as strongly as Prabhupada, but we can also speak the truth in a way that people will be able to understand and accept. Prabhupada did it also, too. Honest, intelligent people will, would accept Prabhupada. But those who are sentimentalists, who think that everybody is okay. Just nowadays, I was just speaking to one devotee on the phone yesterday. How nowadays, you have your opinion about God, I have my opinion about God, and so we have to respect everyone else, everyone's opinion. There's no, there's no right, right opinion. Everybody's opinion is right because it's, a, it's, it's your opinion. Therefore, you have to respect that. I remember I was at Arathiatra in, uh, in America a couple of years ago. It was in Boston. And so right after the Rath Yatra, we had the Pando program with all the do different uh, displays. So I was sitting in the question and answer booth. So one young man came up to me and he said, I have some questions for you. And I said, okay. He said, well, but it wasn't more like question. He was actually telling me his opinions on everything. So I basically said, well, we accept the opinions of God and God's pure representative. And he became quite annoyed by my statement. <laughs> because it's like you have to accept everybody's opinion as being good. So I tried to explain that actually, you know, it's nice you have your opinion, but there are people who actually have the right opinion. And they're the ones that and we give the understanding according to Shastra. Of course, he didn't want to hear that. All he wanted to hear was, he wanted me to, for me to listen to his ideas, which were completely crazy. Mm -hmm. It's just like, uh, so this is the way it is nowadays. People are, they read a few books or they get some ideas and they come up with an opinion and they think that's it. Prabhupada said, God is like this, and your opinion doesn't change it. <laughs> doesn't change it. This is the way he is. <laughs> so you have to hear from the authorities, 
and accept it based on that. So we have a difficult time in this age because people are somewhat, what we say, they wear their philosophy as a type of personality. And if you challenge their philosophy, you challenge them. Years ago, if people had different philosophies, in Vedic culture, they would get together and have a discussion. And the person who would win the discussion, based on the, the scriptures, the loser would become that person's, uh, you know, follower. In other words, they would immediately give up the wrong idea and accept the right idea based on who won the debate. And that's the way things went on. People would accept truths, but they would ex they would explain it in a, in a discussion type thing. Nowadays, yatamata tatapata. <laughs> I'm okay. You're okay. He's okay. We're all okay. <laughs> but what is the result? Nobody knows what they're supposed to do or why they're doing whatever they're doing. It's just... Life is just some whimsical series of activities that people do just to fill up the day. And when they hear something they like, they believe it. They believe it for a little while, then they change after something. Some later, some other time, they hear something else different. They throw that other one away and adopt a new one. So we're living in a very, uh, what we say, misdirected civilization. As it says in the very beginning of Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam is the light in this age of Kali Yuga, which is a the civilization that is misdirected. <laughs> misdirected towards sense gratification. So, yeah. So, we look towards the Vedic culture and the tradition of great souls when they used to meet and discuss and people were interested in hearing the truth based on this, the, this real scripture, Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, and Ramayana, which were the three favorite scriptures of everyone throughout India. And these were the most important and favorite of all. Okay, so we'll stop here. Any comments, questions? Hare Krishna. Um, this is connected to Juva Maharaj, something from the fourth canto. Shall I read the question? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a short introduction here. The fact that Juva Maharaj got upset and was aggrieved and envious of his enemies, that wasn't uh, really in line with his position as a great devotee. Mm, yes. So this understanding that devotees shouldn't get angry like that, be envious or lament. So the question is how to, how to properly understand this envy and lamentation and whatever was present. It's interesting. We had a large discussion based on this point. When I was in India, I was given the class and the question also came up because it seems like Truva Maharaj was acting in the way that he shouldn't. But when you analyze the specific, he, uh, his brother was killed by a yaksha. Mm -hmm. And so he took revenge and he attacked the whole yaksha race. And then it was a big fight. And Dhruva Maharaj was a powerful Kshatri, and so he was just dispatching all these yakshas to the, the uh, abode of Yamaraj. So it seems like he got carried away with personal sentiment based on family affection. Based on family affection. And what happened was until Kuvera came, when Kuvera came and then said, hey, Druva, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, there was only one Yaksha that actually was the 
cause of the why are you killing all these yakshis? So stop. So as soon as Kuvera instructed Druva, and Druva stopped. And then Kuvera was very pleased and Kuvera awarded him accordingly. So it mentions there that as a devotee, a devotee doesn't become, what we say, overcome by envy and anger. But certain cases can also spark these qualities. And this seems like this is an unusual case in the, in the life of Dhruva Maharaj. And it was also inspired by family affection. Like that. But Dhruva was just, you know, killing hundreds of these yakshas. So the point is that sometimes you see in the life of a devotee, a devotee will act maybe a little bit outside of the proper due to a circumstance, may get angry, may exhibit a little bit of envy, but they know it's wrong. So when they are either instructed or they realize what they're doing, they stop. It's not that they justify or they keep going. So it can happen because these elements of anger, envy are so, what we say, prominent within the atmosphere that it can happen to anyone, even advanced devotees. But they recognize it and when they do, they give it up. They will uh, Just now, you said that uh, in uh, Satya Yuga it was not si sinful, sinful activities, but this happened, I, how I know, in Satya Yuga and also we have Daksha and Shiva. I will speak without envious, but he have eyes like monkey, as <laughs> Daksha said, <laughs> and uh, also what more um, in Satya Yuga. Uh, some, we, we can uh, find uh, uh, Hiranyakashipu. And uh, also this is sinful activities around him. Uh, okay, maybe we can say that this is uh, Krishna pastimes, but it looked like was there something like sinful activities? <laughs> hmm. It says 99.9% .9 of the population in Satya Yuga were pious or religious or spiritual or minded. <coughs> Only a small percent were not. Rani Kashipu, we can't use him as an example because he came in order to, as his, in, to fight with the Lord on the instructions of the Lord. See, he's... But in the case of uh, Daksha, I'm not sure, was that such a yuga? So, w w with uh, Lord Shiva? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Sarvana Binda is saying it didn't happen on this planet. But generally, <coughs> but Prabhupada's statement is 99.9%. .9%, so there's that 0.1%. <laughs> that is more, maybe more materialistically oriented to some degree. But it's so small and insignificant. There's no support for that. Uh, poisoned to small baby or something like that, huh? Yeah. It was also some envy. That was envy. envy, yeah. envy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure. It, it doesn't really rem It doesn't recognize. It doesn't mention the yuga for that. Um. I think that was straight to yuga, from what I understand. 
my, my reading of that one. Or if it wasn't, it was at the end of Satya Yuga, coming into Treta Yuga. But as the e ages go on and they move towards Kali Yuga, more of the characteristics, materialistic characteristics start to enter in gradually. Just like the four regulative principles or the four principles of religious life correspond with the different ages. So when Satya Yuga is lost, one of the regulative one of those religious principles is pretty much lost also. We are now in, tra in Kali Yuga, all we have left is a little truthfulness. In the previous age, austerity was lost. In the previous age before that, no, previous age, merciful was lost. In the previous age, austerity, cleanliness, so these four principles are gradually lost as the ages go from one age to another. Yeah. So yeah, <coughs> the principle is in the material world everything goes down. <laughs> everything is heading towards less. Therefore, in order to practice spirituality and make spirituality spread, you have to really work for it. Materialistic things happen automatically. It's just the nature of this. It's just like, you know, you might say, well, why is it cold in winter time? Well, because it's winter time. Why is it materialistic in the material world? Because it's the material world. That's why Prabhupada Krishna says, Dukalayam Ashashvatam. It's a place of suffering. It's a place of, you can't stay here even if you have a nice position. It's temporary and full of misery. So, Prabhupada said the material world is more or less different levels of, of uh, suffering. Some less, some more. Mm -hmm. And these characteristics, lust, anger, greed, envy, mm -hmm. you can see envy even happens in spiritual circles. But the bodhis recognize it and then somehow or other try to overcome it. But in the material world, envy is a, a principle where people use that in order to get what they want and push another person out of a, a position they want or to destroy another person like that. So, but the bodhis sometimes feel, you know, like, Sometimes one devotee might feel unhappy because another devotee is getting more recognition than him. So that's kind of like an, a tinge of envy there. I'm, I'm making nice advancement. I'm serving nicely, but I'm not getting any recognition. Other people are getting recognition. Why is that person getting recognition? Why not me? So... And sometimes that comes, but the devotee realizes, oh, this is wrong, I shouldn't think like that. <laughs> we know it's wrong, we can even see it sometimes, but because we're still somewhat affected by the material energy, these things come. Mm -hmm. Papa said even in the spiritual world there's envy, but it's not mean-spirited. The gopis will see another gopi serving Krishna nicely, and Krishna is pleased by that. So they'll think, wow, that gopi served Krishna so nicely, I'm going to serve Krishna even better than that other gopi. I'm going to do better. So it's not that they try to defeat them, they just want to please Krishna. So this competition to please Krishna comes out in the form of wanting to do better than others who are serving Krishna. So who benefits? Krishna. <laughs> and they always congratulate if someone does better than another one, they always say, oh, you serve so nicely. They don't feel like, well, I feel bad because you serve better than I did or you have more than me. No, they don't feel like, they always congratulate and feel happy for the person who's the best. 
That's why they all know Radharani is the best. And so no one can please Krishna like Radharani does. So they always push Radharani forward because they know Krishna is most pleased with them. So there's sometimes transcendental anger, transcendental envy, even transcendental greed to some degree, greedy for more and more service. But there's no, what the word is, mean spirit, there's no negative feelings in it. It's all just a matter of sometimes competing because competition is is the nature of life. There's always that competition. It comes out in different forms. But when it's done by anger and envy, then it's uh, material. If you want, uh, can you speak about this subject accordingly, uh, according to Varna and Ash? Sometimes maybe devotees is not recognized by their nature. Example, they never call me in some leadership. They never call me that I give a lecture, but I st study all these days, or something like this. Is it uh, very um, important for leaders uh, recognize nature of devotees? and uh, find out uh, what their nature yeah. put in a position. Yeah, it is very important. And that's one of the business of those who are in a position of leadership to observe the per devotees who are working under them and see what qualities they're exhibiting and try to uh, feed that quality so it becomes better and bigger. Like that. Yeah. And that way, nice service is done, and the devotee being make, becomes happy. Yeah, that's important. That's mentioned in the first canto. It says that the spiritual master, Prabhupada says, spiritual master must observe his disciples to see what are their characteristics and qualities and try to engage them accordingly. Mm -hmm. That is the basis of Van Ashram. But prior to that basis, education is there to train people in different ways so these qualities come out and when they come out by training then it becomes obvious what are the inclinations of different devotees. So that's why Prabhupada wanted the Van Ashram College for training people to become Brahmanas, to become Kshatriyas, to become Vaishyas and to learn how to serve. So training has to be there. Yeah. We don't train people. We just they come into the temple. We say, "All right, we need this done here. Here's the mop. Go clean that." <laughs> uh, here we need some vegetables cut. Can you have come into the kitchen? <laughs> well, here's some painting to do. Can you do that? Or, um, in other words, the need of the temple becomes the way people are engaged and not so much the devotee. Therefore, the principle of an ashram and the principle of development is to see what the devotees need and then engage that in Krishna's service. Mm -hmm. And you take care of the devotees first, then the devotees will take care of the temple. But if we take care of the temple and, and just use the devotees in different ways, you'll find devotees don't stay. They, they come, they stay for a little while, and then they move on. Then somebody else new comes in, and we do the same thing. So it's important for training. Education, training. Training in different services, education and spiritual topics like that. Okay. Just like there was one Gurukul teacher was reporting to Prabhupada. This was one Gurukul in India. And Prabhupada was listening and he was describing the schedule. And Prabhupada was listening to the schedule, making some adjustments like that. Finally, the boy and the man said, we have one boy 
when he comes to class for the lessons, he's always disrupting the class. He uh, makes it hard for the other students to learn, and he doesn't seem to be interested in learning. He's always just wanting to do something else, and he's very disruptive. The Prabhupada said, well, well, put him on the farm and give him some work to do. He's obviously, he's not meant for Brahminical training. Because Prabhupada established the idea, well, we have to train people in the Brahminical way. But when it comes obvious that this person's inclination is not for learning, then we have so many other services that they can engage in. And then they can do good in those services and contribute nicely. So yeah, it's important, very important, to observe those and see how they can be engaged nicely. Yeah. Okay, yes? <coughs> this is a question by Mo Mohanasi Nirada Dasi. Uh, how powerful could be the mind and our thoughts in Kali Yuga and other Yugas? Read it again. How powerful could be the mind and our thoughts in Kali Yuga and other Yugas? Well, everybody has ma mental power. Some people have more mental power than others. <laughs> the question is, what do you do with the mental power? <laughs> Some people have very powerful minds, very active minds. I know a few people here in Croatia like that, and minds are always working constantly. People have different natures. If you study Vedanta psychology, the book by Suhotra Swami, he wrote that book, you'll see that people have different natures. So the natures and characteristics are one of the characteristics that some people have a very strong mind, and some people minds are not so strong. So you'll find that in everywhere you go, there's a mixture of different types of mentalities like that, based on on one's karma like that. So you have to learn how to control your mind. That's the most important thing. It becomes we c if it's uncontrollable, then it looks powerful, but that necessarily doesn't mean it's powerful because it's uncontrolled. It's just that it's just not controlled. Therefore, some minds are harder to control than others because of the nature of the mind. But still, the idea is that when you control it and direct it, then it becomes your friend. And if it's powerful, it can be used in a, a way to spread Krishna consciousness nicely and to, and to advance in your own devotional life. So, if she's talking about memory, that's one of the things that this age is decreasing in. In previous ages, people could remember easily. Now memory is lost. In this age, memory, bodily strength, mercifulness, and longevity of life gradually reduce. People are living less. Uh, their memories are less. Their bodily strength is less. And their, uh, mm, what's the other one? Mercifulness is less also. That's the effect of this age. So yeah, in previous ages, people had better memories, much better. We have the example of um, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was living in Navadweep. There was one scripture that was being taught in a place called Mithila. And uh, <coughs> Mithila wouldn't allow this scripture, I forgot the name of this scripture, it was a big scripture too. They wouldn't allow this scripture to be taught anywhere else. You couldn't take the scripture and teach it anywhere else. So Navadweep wanted that scripture. But Mithila said, no one can learn it. No one, we will not give that scripture anywhere else. So Sarabhoma Bhattacharya went to Mithila, listened to the whole discourse on the scriptures, memorized everything, and later wrote it all down. 
we have examples even Ramanujacharya's um, servant Kure, Kroesh, what is his name? Kuresh? Kuresh. When uh, Ramanujacharya wanted a one copy of one particular scripture, this is a long, long story. He managed to get it, but the Brahmins didn't want to give it to him. The Lord arranged for him to get it, and when the Brahmins found that he had it, they came after him and took the scripture back. And then Ramanujacharya was wowed, wow, but Kuresh had read the whole scripture the night before and remembered everything and then told everything to Ramanujacharya, and then later on he wrote it all down. <laughs> so where do you get such memory? We read, and how much do we remember? We can't even remember, you know, what we read sometimes, like how much we read, you know. In this age, it says that people generally remember 5%, no, 10% of what they read. This is the general feature of this age. People remember 10% of what they read, 20% of what they hear, 10% of what, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they see and hear together, when you combine hearing and seeing together, it's up to 50%. They remember 70% of what they do, and they remember 90% of what they teach. You want to remember something? Speak it. <laughs> yeah, because memory comes by speaking. This is a statistic. That's done in the material world. Bhakti Tirtha Swami. He, he did that research and came up with that statistic. And this is uh, how generally people accept memory like that. So in this case, memory is short, especially for reading. Like that. When we read, we generally forget. So the best thing to do is when you read, just go out and when you're with the other devotees, just start talking about it. <laughs> You know, oh, I read this today. Oh, okay, well, let me hear. <laughs> and you have some Krishna Kata going. <laughs> yes, uh, anything else? Can, can sports on a social level uh, be dovetailed with Krishna consciousness. It depends what sports they are. Prabhupada mentions that in illicit sex, intoxication, meeting, and gambling. Gambling also means engaging in frivolous sports. That's another, what we say, definition of gambling. So there are sports that are Vaishnava sports. Mm -hmm such as swimming, wrestling, <laughs> I don't know about boxing, <laughs> but wrestling and swimming are Vaishnava sports. That's what it mentions. I've seen devotees play frisbee too. I played a few games of frisbee. <laughs> Work, huh? Well, that's not sports, that's, <laughs> that's gardening. <laughs> yeah, like that, that's nice. Well, yeah, gardening, yeah. Yeah, gardening is a nice, it's also very mode of goodness service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, these two things are only mentioned like that. We do have competitions, like there was a thing called, was it, what was it, Krishna something? 
Krishna or something. It was a game that devotees came up where you would ask persons questions based on one scripture and then they would see who could remember. And then the one who got the most points, they won. Like that. You read and then you ask questions like that. Give points for right answers. So that's a kind of c competition there. Krishna quiz, that's what it was called, the yeah, Krishna quiz. So book distribution has turned into a somewhat of a, you know, uh, an effort to be the top man so he can beat the other guys out. So some competition is there, but that's good because it inc increases the book distribution. But that's the only things that are mentioned in Vedic culture: swimming and and uh, wrestling. We did some boxing in New Vrindavan many years ago, but it didn't work. Too many people got hurt, so they stopped. <laughs> it was Monday night, bo mo bo Monday night at the boxing ring. Gloves, yeah. But still, you know, we had some pretty big guys there. <laughs> I never got into it. I was like... I watched a couple of them and I thought, I'm, this is all Maya. <laughs> so. So. But that competitive nature can't be subliminated to nothing. You have to use it in Krishna's service. Yeah. It's good. It's healthy if it's done in, in, in for Krishna's service. Okay, so should we stop here? Okay, thank you. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai.